Well, I was born in Chicago. My parents wrote a bestseller book in, in the 40s, and we went traveling, and I actually went to first grade in Florida and then moved up to New York and back to Chicago. I went to a folk school there called the Old Town School of Folk Music, and right out of that school, I got hired by a group called the Limelighters, and I've been on the road ever since. I was 17 back then, and then I worked for the Chad Mitchell Trio and Bobby Darren and Judy Collins and formed the Birds, and we had a couple of number one hits with Mr. Tambourine Man and Turn, Turn, Turn. And uh, Eight Miles High was uh, a hit as well. And so um, I broke up the birds in 1973, and I've been going solo ever since. And I've had bands. I've had five or six uh, solo albums with a band and then a few acoustic. And lately, I've uh, started doing folk music more than I was. I'm going back to my roots, which was the Old Town School of Folk Music. And I decided to, to preserve the old folk songs by putting them up on the Internet. I record them here in my home studio on a computer and uh, turn them into real audio or mp3s and put them up on the internet for free download and the idea was just to keep them going because they're wonderful old songs and nobody was doing them the new folk singers are singer songwriters pretty much and they weren't doing the traditional stuff so i thought i'd do my part that's kind of a global community service and i've been doing that since 1995. most of it will be recorded here unless i have to go out to get drum and bass tracks in a studio which will be recorded in digital format, and then I'll dump it into the Dell and be able to edit it here. I haven't used analog tape since about 10 years ago when I did an album called Back From Rio, um, and we recorded that on 24-track analog, and uh, that was the last analog project I've done. My last two CDs have been done actually on my computer. And uh, the Live From Mars was a series of DAT tapes, digital tape, that we dumped into a Dell and edited, and produced a DAT tape of the final mix and gave it to the record company and they gave us a check. In the years that have gone by since uh, analog tape was the king of recording, uh, most of the studios now are using a thing called Radar, which is a uh, digital recording system, and they can link up several machines. There are 24 tracks and 48 tracks and, and so on. And uh, so the files that are, are recorded are WAV files or recorded in AIFF, the, uh, the other format. So uh, what we can do is with these is take them and dump them into a Dell for editing. And I've been doing that lately. We recorded something up in Nashville, and they gave me the multi-track on a couple of CDRs, and I dumped them into this Dell laptop and I was able to edit them. Well, years ago, uh, you had to record the tape. That was the only way to do it. And they developed, uh, then they developed a digital audio tape recorder, multi-tracks. Uh, now Sony makes one 48-track digital audio tape for about $260,000. Well, for about $2,000, you can get a Dell laptop and do the same thing if you have the right software. So it's changed tremendously. It used to cost a million dollars to do what I've got in that box over there. And now with uh, Cool Edit Pro, which is a uh, multi-track recording software, and this wonderful Dell laptop, I can combine the two and make, make records. May the road rise to meet you. Yeah, I could stay home, I could sit here in front of this computer and record tracks and I'd punch the record button and if I like it, I'll keep it. If I don't like it, I'll do it again. And there's no studio time to worry about and I don't have to worry about musicians or anything. It gives me tremendous latitude. I can, uh, I can get things perfect without worrying about the pressure of paying $1,000 a day for the studio. Uh, non-linear editing, you can go in down to the sample, which is in this case 44,100 per second, and you can move one sample around. Well, you wouldn't even be able to hear that, but you can take a note and you can change it. You can change its pitch. You can remove it or add another note in that place. You can do all kinds of things. You can copy a note from somewhere else. You can copy a phrase. If you have a background harmony that you like, you can take that and copy it just like you do on a word processor and move it over to another section and, and it'll fit flawlessly. You won't be able to tell that it it wasn't recorded specifically for that. So it's tremendous uh, latitude in editing, much better than we used to have to take a razor blade and cut the tape and then paste it together with, you know, it was really awkward. And uh, if you didn't like it, you'd have to undo it and do it again. And people had these little strips of tape hanging on the wall and, you know, it was really a mess. And now you can just do this in a few seconds and it has an undo feature. If you don't like it, you can just undo it and do it again. It's really great. May the road rise to meet you, may the wind be at your back, may the sun shine warm upon your land. 
I find that when I record digitally, it's not a sterile sound if you use good microphones. That's the key. If you use a warm, like a tube uh, microphone, which I have, or even good uh, transistor condenser mics, that's the key to getting a really good sound. Um, there's nothing sterile about CD quality. I mean, it sounds very good. It sounds warm enough if you put a warm sound on there. Uh, I remember a few years ago, Elvis Costello was recording, and he would record the bass and drums to a 16-track analog so that he could saturate the tape and get a really big, full sound. And then they would dump that into digital. So the warm sound, once you got it, you could keep it in the digital domain. And there's nothing inherently um, you know, that isn't warm about digital. If you put a warm sound on digital, it's going to sound warm. It's much more fun to record, and the freedom, the latitude of being able to edit and, and fly things around and make them uh, go where I want them to is, is just amazing. My first uh, exposure to using a computer for recording was back in 1991. Terry Melcher, who had been the producer for The Birds, and I always loved working with him, invited me to go out and record a session with the Beach Boys. And I thought that would be cool. So I flew out to Carmel, California, went to Terry's house, and I expected to see a 24-track uh, audio recorder and, and all kinds of you know, boards and everything set up. Instead, he had a computer and a couple of good microphones, and that was it. And I went, what is this? And he told me it was a digital audio recording program, and he was, he was actually mixing MIDI in there and using MIDI effects and bass and all that stuff, and then digital audio vocals and guitars and mixing it all together. And it sounded great. He released a whole Beach Boy album that he recorded in his house, like that. We recorded a, uh, a track, and I can solo this and play just the track we recorded. It's called it. It's a scratch vocal with guitar and vocal, and uh, it's something to work along with. It just with an acoustic guitar, and then I put the vocal in, and like this. Oh, I see. That that's just a guitar track. So this guitar track and then vocals. Um, I can solo this one. And Sing out on the road. there's a vocal and I put a little effect on it. There's a little reverb on there. Okay, and then, then I, I've got another vocal down here. Sing out on the road. And when you play them together, <clears throat> it has a nice effect. There are two of them soloed. Sing out on the road. It's a little kind of echoey effect, and it supports the, if something goes a little sharper flat, the other one covers for it, so it sounds more full. Sing out on the road. Okay, and there it is with just the, uh, the vocals selected. I'll un unselect that and just play the whole thing from there. And while we were here, we put on this guitar track, which is a Rickenbacker electric guitar with compression on it. That's why it has that sustained sound. So we unsolo that and hear how it sounds with the it used to be when these digital programs came out that the effects were kind of cheesy. They sounded cheap, like cheap reverb and so on, but they've improved tremendously. And uh, it's hard to tell the difference now between a, like a thousand dollar reverb unit that you'd find in a big studio and the, the reverb that comes in the program. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. And here's how it sounds with the whole track. May the road rise to meet you. It's very simple. I find it easy to use, uh, especially this program, Cool Edit Pro. Uh, I've gone through quite a few of them, and uh, I find the learning curve on it is pretty short, and you can just go in there. It's intuitive. You can figure it out just without reading the manual, and you'll be up and running in a, in a few hours. I was just up in Nashville last week, and the studios are starting to use this as their primary recording thing, and they have a 24-track analog machine in the corner if somebody's old-fashioned and they want to come in and use it. But basically, they're all recording to WAV file format now. And move it hard right, and then we'll have an interesting effect here. When you play it back, it'll sound uh, like very stereo. It'll be a good stereo sound. I've been a gadget uh, fancier since I was about three years old. My grandfather was an engineer in Chicago, and he used to take me to the Museum of Science and Industry there and let me push buttons and see things whir and light up. And I've always loved that, uh, the, all the technology. I've been really into it all my life. And I think they sound a little too far apart, so I'm going to change the, uh, the balance on it. That sounds pretty good there. 
lately I've become not as early an adapter as I used to be. I used to like buy them right off the bat. I had a briefcase telephone in 1971 that the thing weighed about 12 pounds. It had a 25 watt transceiver inside of it, like a two way radio. And you had to call the operator, you know, operator, this is JR49950. I'd like to place a call to. And it was like pretty old fashioned technology. And now we got cell phones we can put in our pocket and they do a better job. So, uh, but I was an early adapter back then. I think I spent $3,000 on that thing. And people said, you're crazy. But I loved it. I had a good time with it. I used to call from airplanes, and the captain would let me. Well, I'm going to take it on the road and use it uh, at live um, performances. I'm going to put it at the soundboard and record every show. And after the show, burn it off to a CDR and then save the hard drive space for another recording and just go around the country making uh, recordings of all the shows and make them available to people who want them. It will. It'll give me, I won't have to wait till I come home to do this sort of thing. Before I used to record something and then I'd have to wait till I got back home to work on it. Now I can work on it anywhere. This is a remote controller that gives you the, uh, the playback uh, and record and stop and rewind and fast forward functions that you would have on a big tape recorder. This gives you mute, solo, and record. And this is a track select. You can move this around and it'll change the tracks. And this changes the track volume and the master volume. So you can turn the master volume up and down with this. And you can add cues with this. This is uh, if you want to start recording a vocal part at a certain position, you just cue it at a certain place and it'll go back to that every time. So it, it saves you a lot of travel time going back and forth, finding it, it'll just pop to it. So you can just play back like that. Stop like that. If you want to record enable, you find uh, the track, you select the track with this. There's a blank track and then you record enable it and the little red light comes on. The red light comes on here and also on the screen. And then when you hit the record button, you'll be recording. And you can disable the record button and it won't record over it again. Kind of keeps it. And this is a metronome. If you, if you enable this, it'll... You can set the metronome up and you should put it down first so you'd be playing with the click track. And then you... Uh, we, we didn't set it up for this song. This is sort of a freeform song. It's not really in a strict time. So the metronome won't synchronize with it. But if you put the metronome down first, it would synchronize with it and give you a click track to play with which is what a lot of people like to do because they can record a track and then uh, add more musicians later and they're all synchronized together. I think what excites me most about composing and recording digitally is the freedom I have. I'm not stuck in a studio worrying about a thousand dollars a day studio time and uh, there's the pressure that's off because in the studio the red light comes on and everybody no matter how professional they are they kind of freeze up a little bit and then they have to get over that hump. Well that doesn't happen when you're at home and relaxed in your own environment and I think it's just much more relaxed and, and enjoyable to record at home. Writing a song is uh, kind of a formula. You basically have to work at it. It's, it's like writing a book or something. You have, to, you have to discipline yourself into sitting down and actually working at it. You can't just wait for the inspiration, although it has happened a few times when a whole song has come to me in a dream or, or when I'm driving in the car, but that's unusual. The, the usual process is actually sitting down and saying, okay, we're going to write songs. And, and in my case, I like to write with my wife. So we'll kick ideas back and forth. I'll come up with a, uh, a pattern like some chords and I'll string a melody over it like and then I'll put words to it and usually the melody will suggest words and then the whole thing will come together and then I usually lay down a scratch track of just guitar and vocal and I work from that and then I'll put uh, a real vocal over it, a keeper vocal, and then I'll put some keeper guitar parts over it, maybe some lead work and uh, bass and, and if I'm using drums, I'll, I will have put the drums on first. So it's, it's a process of layering things and uh, I've gotten up to 30 tracks on uh, this laptop so far.
you know, I'm really grateful to live in a time when they have stuff like this, but we uh, started recording the birds with an 8-track, and I remember the engineers at Columbia Records were scared of the 8-track because it was too big. They called it the big monster, you know, and they had a big sign on it, and they had it over in the corner. They didn't want to hook it up. They were scared of it because they were using 2-track and 3-track. I think they had a 4-track, and that was the most they had. And uh, so the 8-track was a big deal back then, and if we'd had a 128-track in a box, it would have been incredible. When I recorded my uh, CD, Treasures from the Folk Den, I went to Pete Seeger's house, and his wife Toshi looked at my setup and she said, wow, you've got a half a million dollar recording studio in a box. And I said, you're right, that's it. It would cost that much money to put all those things together back then. Uh, one of my favorite albums of uh, Tom Petty's is Full Moon Fever, and they recorded that in Mike Campbell's garage, which has no soundproofing at all. And there were jets flying over and dogs barking, and they just edited around all that stuff and came out with a, a great sounding CD. So you don't really need a soundproof environment. Although, you know, you might lose a few minutes here and there. You might have more downtime, but it's really no big deal. We had to do a lot of compromising back then with eight tracks. We had to blend things together on one track that were locked in and you couldn't change them and this would give a lot more flexibility.